Hi there, everyone. It's Christy back again for another reading of the research I've conducted on sex and gender as sources of heterogeneity and political attitudes and behaviors in Britain. And in this section, I'm going to be dealing mostly with the background of the British state of political science in terms of its understanding of sex differences. So far in the introduction, um, sorry, in, so far in the chat in the chapter, we spent a lot of time looking at common ways that American political scientists have tried to understand the what they call the gender gap, and what they mean by the gender gap is to uh, explain why women's behavior is different from men's. So, sorry, just a second. <coughs> The, and I have a critique of this as being problematic because if you problematize women's behavior without problematizing men's behavior, then you don't have an explanation for half of the population, which is part of the thing that my thesis attempts to address. But in order to get to that point, the first thing I have to do in my doctoral thesis is explain where the state of the discipline is currently at the time that I was writing. And we've done a lot of the American political science gender gap theory. We are now moving on to the state of, like I said, British political science and men and women's political behavior. And that is what I'm going to do in this section. So settle in and remember that I'm only doing this in one take and occasionally I will stop for water breaks. I'm also getting a bit of a cold. So if I do have a, I need a break to cough or whatever else, I'll definitely turn away from the mic and try to edit that out. Anyway, let's get going on the British gender gap and issue preferences. The final section of this chapter presents the relevant findings on sex differences in issue preferences and vote choice in the British context. As noted above, the possible explanatory power of the sex variable in political attitudes and behavior was overlooked from the earliest days of British political science until the 1980s. Early analysis of sex differences in political attitudes and behaviors in the British context was dominated by one researcher in particular, Pippa Norris, whose investigations into sex differences in political preferences began in the 1980s. Norris, 1985, 1986, 1988, 1993, 1996, 1999, 2001, and Norris et al., 2004. More recently, additional researchers have engaged in experimental and quantitative analysis into the role of, of sex differences, often phrased as gender differences or gendered behavior, in British political attitudes and behaviors. I'm just going to read off this list very quickly because I did it for Norris. Campbell's and Winters, 2008. Johns and Shepard, 2007. Winters and Campbell's, 2007. Campbell and Winters, 2006b. Campbell, 2006. Campbell, 2004. Hayes, 1997. The works of the two main analysts of sex differences in British political behavior, Pippa Norris and Rosie Campbell, are reviewed below. Pippa Norris's 19... Sorry got a little ahead of myself with the tabbing. I'm still kind of getting a hang of this. Thanks for your patience. Pippa Norris's 1986 article, Conservative Attitudes in Recent British Elections, an Emerging Gender Gap, investigated British gender differences in political issues. Norris examined elections to determine whether or not men and women differed on is salient issues, for example, the National Health Service or defense, and if there were differences, whether those differences could be explained by consistent ideological tendencies, either left-wing or right-wing, in men or women's responses. Using data from the 1979 British election study and a 1983 general election Gallup BBC survey, Norris chose a cross-section of economic, environmental, foreign policy, and social issues from recent elections. Using the 1979 data, Norris found middle-aged women were more supportive of, and men more opposed to, the government withdrawing the army from Northern Ireland. The same age group of women were more supportive of increasing funds for the National Health Service, a position Norris reported as being left-wing. Analyzing right-wing issues, Norris found men more supportive of expanding nuclear power than women of all ages. However, women expressed a higher willingness to curb communists within Britain. On the basis of those results, Norris concluded that there were no consistent ideological differences in men, men and women's political views. <laughs> 
When Norris examined the 1983 data, she found more similarities than differences, although young men were more likely to be critical of Labour's proposal to give up Polaris nuclear weapons, women were more likely to support Labour's proposed commission to freeze or re reduce prices. At the time, Norris concluded that no ideological gender gap in left-right policy positions was to be found in Britain. In a later work, Norris, 1996, applied the gender generation gap theory to the analysis of the left-right self-placement measures available in the Eurobarometer data. She found that in 1983, younger women positioned themselves slightly left of men, while older women positioned themselves slightly right of men, suggesting an interaction between sex and age. A decade later, the gender generation gap remained, with younger women slightly more left-wing than younger men, middle-aged women slightly more right-wing than middle-aged men, and older men and women being quite similar in their self-placement. Using data from the 1997 and 2001 British election studies, Campbell found evidence in support of an ideological gender generation gap, similar to the findings of left-right self-placement in Norris's work from 1996. Campbell found that women born following the Second World War were to the left of men in their self-placement answers, and that women born after 1957 were more left-leaning on Heath et al.'s socialist laissez-faire scale. This evidence supports the Inglehart and Norris modern gender generation gap theory. A more recent investigation of responses to the 2001 British election studies open-ended most important issue question revealed sex differences, sex difference patterns in men and women's political preferences. Campbell examined the 2001 data using cross-tabulation analysis and found that women were far more likely than men to cite either education or the National Health Service as their most important issue. Campbell also found an important interaction effect between sex and age. Women who were of childbearing age were more likely to cite education as their main priority, and older women were more likely to rate the National Health Service as their most important issue. Economic issues predominated for men. Campbell found that taxation was the most important issue to men aged 25 to 35. The economy was cited by more men than women in every age group over the age of 25, and immigration was the top issue for men aged 18 to 25. In order to best understand sex differences in Britain, Campbell concluded that subgroup analysis, for instance the interaction of age and sex, or parenthood and sex, are important components for the analysis of data. The British gender gap and vote choice. In contrast to the United States, Britain's recent elections had no equivalent gender gap in vote choice. At the aggregate level, there are some differences in men and women's vote choice, but not a statistically significant gap repeatedly found in the same partisan direction as is the case in the United States. The lack of a statistically significant gender gap in voting preferences has led in Britain has led British scholars to focus upon subgroup differences. For example, the work of Norris, which demonstrated a gender generation gap in which younger women are more likely to vote for the Labour Party than younger men. The work of Campbell also builds upon this gender generation gap and adds parenthood as a variable with which to divide men and women into subgroups in order to more accurately analyze sex differences. Norris, 1993, documented the percentage differences in men and women's voting for the two major parties in British elections, Conservative and Labour. See Table 1.2. From 1945 until 1992, women were more supportive of the Conservative Party, and this trend was noticed as a weak point in Labour's support. This was especially true before the mid-1970s, when the gender gap in vote choice was in the double digits, 17% in 1951 and 1955, 14% in 1945, 11% in, in 1959 and 1970. From 1974 until 1992, the gender gap closed considerably, never again reaching double digits and exceeding three percentage points only twice, in October of 1974 and in 1992. In her analysis, Norris concludes, sorry, I have to get through this table now to get to the quote afterwards, so if you're listening and you want to see the table, ah, you know what, I really need to get my scrolling mouse for the next one. Let me just go up again. Apologies here for the technical problems. If you want to see what the table looks like, I've gonna, I'm going to put it on the screen. There's a little bit of the notes that you'll miss here, but generally here's the table. 
vote distribution and the gender gap is in the last table under gender gap on the far right hand side. Getting back to Norris's conclusion quote. Initial evidence suggests that in a number of Western countries, the traditional pattern of greater conservative voting amongst women has been replaced by no significant difference between the sexes or a tendency for men to favor right-wing parties. At this stage, we can only speculate about why these changes have developed and whether these gender differences in political attitudes are due to sex role socialization, life experience, the socioeconomic position of the sexes, or inborn difference. Inborn difference. What is clear is that the traditional assumption that women are more conservative than men is no longer valid, if it ever was, and we need to re-examine the changing relationship between sex and voting. Ipsos Mori calculated the sex difference in partisan support using their own data from 1974 through 2001, see Table 1.3. The results show a waxing and waning in British women's tendency to favor the Conservative Party and men's tendency to support Labour. In the election for which data is most recently available, the 2005 British general election at the time of publication, Ipsos Mori polling found probably for the first time ever in a British general election more women than men voted Labour. See Table 1.4. This result, while apparent in some pre-election analysis, did not appear in the post-election result analysis. And again, if you're listening and not looking at the screen, if you'd like to look at the screen, I'm just sc scrolling through the tables that I have reproduced from Ipsos Mori from their data analysis. In her 1993 article, The Gender Generation Gap in British Elections, Norris first discussed the gender gap as described above, indicating women were more likely to vote for the Conservatives and men for Labour, but that the differences declined over time, see Table 1.2. She cites the then-current position, quoting Rose and McAllister, who wrote that gender had no influence upon voting in Britain at that time, contradicting the traditional theory that women favor conservatives when feminist theory predicted that women ought to support labor. Their reasoning is straightforward. On matters that are salient to voting, men and women tend to share similar political values. They asserted that on the on most major sorry try that one again they asserted that on most major political issues men and women divide similarly along lines of party or class not gender norris however found a trend within the sexes amongst the 1992 election results sorry uh, Although the 1992 election result produced a six-point sex difference, with women being more likely overall to vote for the Conservatives, the gender gap, sorry, I'm having really technical problems today, I'm going to get my mouse out for the next one, the gender gap had reverse effects when the generation of the voter was taken into account. In her analysis of longitudinal data, Norris concluded that younger women were the least likely to vote for the Conservative Party in the elections of 1964 to 1992, excluding the elections of 1970 to and uh, October of 1974, while older women had been the most likely to vote Conservative in the same time period, excluding the election of 1983. Norris concludes that, Given the consistency of the trend, the pattern should not be attributed to short-term factors, but needed a long-term explanation. She examines two possible sources for this, structural change and political mobilization, linking, linking the prominent explanation at the time of social grade and vote choice, Norris theorizes that women's lives have Quote, have gradually been transformed by long-term shifts in women's patterns of work and domestic responsibilities. As a result, younger women and men experience a more common lifestyle than their parents' generation. We might expect this significant structural change to be reflected in changing political attitudes and values, unquote. Presenting an alternative account, Norris, 1993, also considers the role of political mobilization of, by the women's movement, drawing upon the theories produced by feminists in the United States to account for the gender gap. To test this theory, Norris uses one of the measures within the 1992 British election study designed to measure attitudes toward gender equality. Using multiple regression techniques, Norris an analyzes the explanatory power of both theories using social grade, education, union membership, gender, and the results of the gender equity scale. The result, results, according to Norris, quote, suggest that amongst 
amongst younger and middle-aged groups, gender continues to provide to prove insignificant. Among older voters, however, gender continues to be an important predictor of a conservative or labor vote. According to these limited measures, the puzzle of why older women in Britain continue to vote conservative cannot be reduced to either simple structural or mobilization theories." Unquote. In 1999, Norris again explored the gender generation gap following the 1997 election. The analysis, not elaborated here, finds that once again the modern gender gap is most evident in the youngest cohort with younger women consistently more labor-leaning than younger men and older women more conservative in their first vote choice in their vote choice than older men. Using logistic regression, she finds that the quote the direct effect of gender on voting, on vote choice. Sorry, let me start, take that one from the top. I got distracted by people having fun and screaming in the background. <laughs> Using logistic regression, she finds that, quote, the direct effect of gender on vote choice was insignificant in the 1997 election. Nonetheless, the results of Model 2 confirm, and I'll just scroll down here, dot, 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 sorry, scroll down here. We've got uh, table 1.5 here. Uh, Pause. Sorry for the dead air. I'm having a real big problem with this today. Let me just try doing it by hand. Oh, that's a nightmare. All right, hold on, guys. I'm going to pause this and try to sort this stuff out. Just a second. Right, let's try that from nonetheless. Nonetheless, the results of Model 2 confirm an important interaction between the effects of gender and age. These differences persisted even after adding controls for structural variables and cultural attitudes. The most extensive work to date on sex and British political attitudes and behavior is Rosie Campbell's Gender and the Vote in Britain, 2006. Campbell's main question is, quote, in what way and to what extent are women's political preferences different to men's as expressed in voting behavior, unquote. Building on the premise that subgroup analysis is an important component of the British gender gap analysis, Campbell found evidence to support the impact of children on women's vote choice in the United Kingdom. Using 2001 data from the British election study, she found that middle or high income women with children were more likely to support labor than others in the sample, and that those women were, one, more likely to support the labor party than men, and two, less likely to support the conservative party. This suggests that for certain income levels, mothering had a distinct impact on women's vote choice from that of men who are also fathers. In testing the gender generation gap theory using 2001 data, Campbell found that female respondents born after 1946 were more likely to support the Labour Party than male respondents, whereas women born before 1946 were more likely to support the Conservative Party. While this seems to confirm the gender generation gap theory, Campbell also noted that in 2001 there was no gender gap in party support between men and women aged 18 to 24. Campbell suggests that this lack of a gender gap may be a function of the importance of the parenthood variable interacting with the income variable, as middle income mothers who are more likely to support the Labour Party are also uh, likely to be over the age of 25. She concludes, quote, Thus, there is little evidence of an aggregate level gender gap whereby being a woman significantly increases the chances that an individual would vote for one party or another, but instead we see a complex pattern of subgroup effects where sex interacts with other background characteristics to produce gendered political attitudes and behaviors." Unquote. However, as Campbell also notes, the British analyses presented above were all limited in that they were all conducted as secondary analysis on already existing data with the variable sex as the only measure to capture the concepts both of biological sex and social, the social construction of gender. This limitation on the way in which concepts of gender can be operationalized limits the conclusions that can be drawn from the analysis. To provide the reader with a pre preview of findings to come in this thesis, the final section of my literature review includes the most recent contributions of Campbell and Winters to the study of political behavior in Britain. The exploratory work of Campbell and Winters, 2006b, qualitatively investigated how sex interacts with other variables to produce gendered patterns of political attitudes and behaviors. In the week preceding the 2005 general election, 
six focus groups were conducted by Rosie Campbell and Christy Winters. The focus groups took place in London, Colchester, Essex, and the six groups were divided by sex into three groups of men and three groups of women, each divided by age, under 40s, over 40s, and a mixed group for each sex. In order to test for any gender generation gap effects, the sampling yield a broadly similar group of men and women to permit comparison by sex. In order to conduct a fair test of gender differences, the same questions were asked in each of the focus groups following a pre-designed interview schedule. We concluded that the most profound differences were not to be found in the content of what men and women discussed as regards political interests, leaders, political issues, and parties, but the way in which men and women discussed them. Similar to the previous findings, which analyzed patterns in responses given to the most important issue question, Campbell 2004, men were more likely than women to raise taxation, Europe, and the economy, while women were more likely to discuss the issues of education, health care, and child care. What was noticeably different was the ways in which men and women discussed them. Women made reference to other people, inserting the views of people they interacted with when discussing their position and relating their use of friends and family for political information. In short, women were more likely to speak from a communal viewpoint. In contrast, men did not bring up their relationships, their children, or the needs of others. Instead, they discussed the campaign in a more distant, abstracted way. Men talked about the strategic ways in which the campaigns were being conducted, the ways the parties were forming their messages. Men expressed interest in the election because some wanted to see if Tony Blair would get a, quote, bloody nose, unquote, as predicted in the media, and expressed more interest in policy debates which were contentious and confrontational. All of these are in line with a more agentic perspective on politics. Our most recent research presented here as, as the conclusion Sorry, I'm going to take that one again. My cold is coming through. Our most recent research presented here as the conclusion to this literature review is a preview of the findings presented in the later chapters of this thesis. Campbell and Winters, 2008, demonstrated that sex and gender are separate concepts which contribute independent explanation to British men and women's interest in politics. Using the measures of agency and communion, which are described more fully in the following chapters, we conducted statistical analysis on men and women's interest in politics. The fact that women generally report having lower levels of interest in politics than men has been, an, has been established by several empirical studies. Then, and there's a whole bunch of them I'm not going to read. <laughs> These studies assume that when evaluating an individual's interest in politics, what is meant by politics has a common definition or is interpreted in a similar way by all the survey respondents. Given the insights of our focus group work, as well as other related empirical findings that men and women have different areas of interest and focus when discussing politics, we questioned whether political sci what political scientists thought of as politics was the same as what men and women respondents conceived of as politics when self-rating how interested they were. To unpack what might be considered political, we not only asked respondents to rate themselves with the commonly used survey questions used to measure interest in politics, quote, thinking about politics in general, how much interest do you generally have in what is going on in politics, but also to rate their level of interest on specific issues or areas which would be considered political. The state of education in Britain, the state of the National Health Service, British foreign policy, for example, the conflict in Iraq, Israel-Palestine, the EU, law and order and crime, including domestic security, British partisan politics, to Blair and Brown party conferences and party campaigning, for example. What we found with confirmatory factor analysis was that the measure of interest in politics is not a unidimensional measure anchored by not at all at one end and very interested at the other. Sorry, not at all interested at one end and very interested at the other. Instead, our analysis showed that there are two dimensions of political interest, one of which is composed of domestic political issues, including health, education, and law and order, and the other which we label general interest in politics, which was composed of high self-reporting on the standard measure of general interest in politics, interest in foreign policy, and interest in partisan politics. In light of the results of our focus groups and other empirical research, it is perhaps unsurprising that the men in our study reported higher levels of interest in general politics and women in domestic politics. 
The results of confirmatory factor analysis revealed that the measure for the self-reported general interest in politics loads onto a single component along with foreign policy and partisan politics. Our findings suggest that it is not simply the case that women are less interested in politics than men. Instead, what respondents associate with the term politics, namely partisan politics and foreign policy, is of less interest to women than men. And those issues which are domestic political issues, education, health policies, and law and order, are of more interest to women generally than men. In addition to these sex-based differences, men and women's interest in politics based upon confirmatory factor analysis, we also used ordinary least squares regression to analyze the explanatory contribution of sex and gender using measures of agency and communion to an individual's interest in politics. Our analysis demonstrates that a high sense of agency had a positive effect on an individual's interest in general politics and that a high level of communion was associated with a higher interest in domestic politics over and above the difference in interest levels accounted for by an individual sex. Conclusion. Although gendered political behavior in Britain is still an under-researched area, since Pippa Norris's pioneering work in the 1980s, recent investigations into areas of com communality and differences in men and women's political behavior indicate that there are both sex and gender differences which need to be explored both qualitatively and quantitatively. This chapter has reviewed the evidence for sex differences in political attitudes and behaviors, the theories that have attempted to account for the gender gap in the United States, and the alternative theories which have been developed to understand sex differences in the British context. In the United States, sociological accounts, such as different moral frameworks due to socialization, shifts in women's economic and legal status, and the effects of the feminist movement have been used to explain why women tend to favor democratic candidates. In Britain, where systematic partisan gaps in partisan identification and vote choice have not been found, demographic accounts involving generational differences, income, and parental, parental status have been used to account for the slight but longitudinally consistent and statistically significant differences in men and women's political attitudes and behaviors. In addition to reviewing the major theories and findings of gendered political behavior in the last several decades, two concepts have been introduced, discussed, and mapped onto the theoretical accounts of the gender gap in the United States agency and communion. These concepts underpin the assumptions made by the theories concerned with the nature and origins of women's increased or decreased autonomy on their political preferences, those made by feminist accounts of gender difference, and those made by sociological theories. In the British context, gender gap analysis has demonstrated the need for examining subgroup patterns to avoid the masking effects of looking at the data only in the aggregate. Pippa Norris's work has demonstrated the role of generational effects, and Rosie Campbell's work demonstrated the necessity of incorporating subgroup analysis, including parenthood and income, when analyzing men and women's political attitudes and behaviors. My own work with Rosie Campbell, using the imported psychological measures of agency and communion, communion introduced in this thesis, demonstrate the need to conceptually disambiguate the terms for and measures of sex and gender when analyzing men and women's political behavior. And then we come to the end of chapter one. So we managed to get through the introduction. That's a really heavy going. The rest of the thesis is not quite that dense in terms of reviewing what other people have done. There's a little bit more of that in the next chapter, which is called Measuring Gender. I want to apologize for the various stumbles and technical difficulties I had throughout this. I had not um, grabbed my mouse, my optical mouse, when I started it, and I didn't want to stop in the middle and, and go and get it, but then I ended up having to do it anyway because I was having a hard time moving from page to page. So I appreciate your patience and your kindness in understanding my technical difficulties, and I'll get on to recording the next chapter. And if you are still uh, awake, and haven't dozed off yet, you are welcome to join me for that, uh, that next chapter. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll talk to you later.